Welcome to Americana Archives. Today's headline is Black Hawk the Warrior, a sketch of one of the most famous of red men. The subheadline is Intelligent and Just. He was a nobleman of savagery. How he and his tribe suffered at the hands of the whites. The end of his band. Black Hawk's dedication of the work of his captor, General Atkinson. It says, Sometime during the early part of the last century, probably, a wandering tribe of Indians, of whom history is silent, left the bleak shores of the upper St. Lawrence for a more congenial climate, says the American field. The sources from which the first part of the sketch is taken are chiefly legendary, but such as they are, it is given as it was taken from the lips of one who was characterized by the editor of a small volume called the Autobiography of Black Hawk as a warrior, a patriot, and subsequently a prisoner, Makata Mashakaya or Black Hawk. Toward the latter part of his life, this hero of many battles, when old, poor, and obscure, became desirous of giving his story to his white friends, that the people of the United States might know the cause which impelled him to act as he had done, and the principles by which he was governed. This was faithfully translated by Antony Leclerc, a half-breed of French and Indian parentage, whose descendants live in Davenport, Iowa. It must be remembered that although Black Hawk's story is intermingled with legends, it is probably true as regards the immigration of the tribes, the Sacs as they were called, from place to place to their final destination, the Rock River country in Illinois. The tradition of the causes which led to this great event in their history was handed down to Black Hawk as coming from his great-grandfather, Nana McKee, who by blackening his face, fasting, and invocation to the Great Spirit, appeared to the chief in dreams, telling him to fast one year more, and then to take his brother chieftains and travel to the left of the sun rising till they could hear certain sounds, when they would meet a white man who would be a father to this people. The sounds were heard, and the white man appeared. He announced himself to be the son of the King of France, and said that he also had fasted four years, that the great spirit had visited him in dreams, telling him he would meet his children, the Indians, and their chief. They returned to their nation. The old chief, when he learned of their meeting the white man, presented the great medicine bag to his son, Nana McKee, saying it was the soul of their nation, that it never had been disgraced, and he hoped it never would be. Nana McKee was a young man, and there were some dissensions among the people on account of so much power being given to one so young. But when the talk was at its height, a violent thunderstorm appeared, and the lightning struck a tree, setting fire to it. Young Nana McKee seized a burning branch, made a fire in the lodge, seated the people around it, who were awed by what seemed to be a miracle, and addressed them. I am young, but the Great Spirit has called me to take the rank I hold. While my father, the chief, lived, I had no wish to take his place. You have seen the power given by the Great Spirit in causing that fire. I wish that the chiefs, my brothers, may never let it go out. All were satisfied when they heard and saw that the Great Spirit had spoken and confirmed his words by the burning tree. In the legend of the burning tree, one is reminded of the burning bush out of which God spoke to Moses regarding the children of Israel. In all accounts of the religion of the Indians, I know of no record where they are represented as worshipping the Great Spirit in any material form of wood or stone. The Great Spirit was immortal and invisible. After a long absence, the French father returned, and a trade was kept up for some time with the tribe, exchanging various commodities for their furs and other articles. The British, who were then at war with the French, at last overpowered them and gained possession of Quebec. Some of the different tribes joined in the war, and afterward united their forces against the Sacs and drove them to Montreal and thence to Mackinac. They met the British father, as Black Hawk calls him, who helped them and furnished them with goods. They were troubled there with their enemies, who drove them from place to place till they reached Green Bay or what is now called Sauk River. There they held counsel with the tribe or nation of foxes, who abandoned their villages and joined the Sacs. A party of young men, had been on an expedition southward as far as Rock River, and the young braves returned to Green Bay full of the great news of the beautiful region they had just left. And soon after, the tribes were en route for the Promised Land. They were joined by the foxes, and from that time, the history of the two tribes seems to be closely entwined. 
for more than 100 years. They held undisputed possession of the Mississippi Valley, from the Wisconsin to the Portage des Sioux, near the mouth of the Missouri, about 700 miles in length. At that time, they had little intercourse with the whites, except with the traders who came to their villages for their peltries. At that time, intoxicating liquors were unknown among them, although afterward introduced by the traders. Black Hawk was bitterly opposed to this, and sometimes, as said by an eyewitness, drove in the kegs of whiskey or rum, which were furnished by the traders. They held their lands by their prowess as warriors. In 1804, an event occurred which gave rise to all their troubles with the whites. One of their number had killed an American, for which he was imprisoned. Four or five Indians went down to St. Louis, where he was confined, to secure his release and his return to his family by offering a compensation for the life of the murdered man, according to the Indian custom. General William Clark, the companion of Lewis, at that time was the general superintendent of Western Indians and their affairs. The government, through Clark, refused the compensation, but demanded lands. Black Hawk and the other Indians, who were informed of the circumstances, were bitterly opposed to parting with their lands, as these men had no authority for this, but went simply to rescue the prisoner. It is said the men were made drunk, and while in that condition, the sale of the lands was consummated. The prisoner was set at liberty, but as he was running from the jail, he was shot dead by one of the men on guard. All their lands on the east side of the Mississippi River were sold, Black Hawk says, for $1,000 a year. Other accounts say $2,000. I think Judge Spencer, in his reminiscences, says the latter. He was one of the old settlers of Rock Island. He speaks of Black Hawk as an honorable and just man. Black Hawk says, I leave it to the people of the United States to say whether our nation was properly represented in that treaty, or whether we received just compensation for the extent of country ceded by these four individuals. A clause in the sale said that the Indians might occupy the lands while they belonged to the government. Black Hawk's narrative is singularly deficient in dates. He was the grandson of Nana McKee. His father was Tyessa, and he was born on the shores of Rock River, near where it empties into the Mississippi. There he remained till he was 15 years old, when he won honorable distinction by wounding an enemy. This was the first event of his life, which he considers of importance enough to record. He was in battle with the Osages, where he saw his father kill a man and tear off his scalp. This fired his ambition, and he attacked and killed and scalped his enemy. There were several expeditions against this tribe. In one of these, his father was mortally wounded, and after his death, Black Hawk fell heir to the great medicine bag of his forefathers. In all his successes in battle, he recognizes the aid of the Great Spirit. Finally, there was peace among the tribes, and they settled quietly down in their villages. It appears that the tribes occupying the land in what is now Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin have been constantly at war with each other. The Indians found the Rock River and Mississippi country exceedingly attractive. The island of Rock Island was a favorite resort for the young people of the tribes. It was there they had their games and dances. They felt that they had found the most beautiful and desirable spot they had ever seen, and determined never to leave it. After their harvest had been secured, and the hunters had returned laden with the spoils of the chase, they gave themselves up to their favorite amusements. They raised corn, beans, squashes, and other vegetables, and cash for winter use. A deep hole was dug in the ground. The vegetables were placed therein and covered with earth and bark. Frequently, the contents of the cash were stolen by their enemies by piercing the ground with their spears. Black Hawk was 35 years old when the first American appeared. The Americans had taken possession of the country about St. Louis. The news of this filled the tribes with apprehension. For as Black Hawk naively says, we had always bad accounts of the Americans who lived near the Indians. The possessions of the Saxon foxes extended as far as Peoria, and thence to strike the Wisconsin River, 80 miles from its mouth, down the river to the Mississippi. They own the whole of Iowa. Colonel Davenport, who was an English trader with the Indians, says, As nearly as I could ascertain, these tribes came from Canada, from a region near Montreal. They were governed by two sets of chiefs, 
civil and war chiefs. The civil chiefs settled troubles between tribes. Black Hawk and Keokuk were the prominent war chiefs. Black Hawk was determined to stay in his village, notwithstanding all the land had been ceded to the government of the United States by the Treaty of 1804. But as the whites were coming in great numbers, seeing the beauty and desirableness of this land, so fair and so fertile, they were continually encroaching upon the domain of the Indians. It will be remembered that there was a clause in the treaty which allowed the tribes to remain in their homes as long as the land was in the possession of the government. But as the white people came, they settled wherever they pleased, plowing up the fields which the Indians had planted and appropriating the land to their own uses. It was determined to remove the Indians, but Black Hawk, profoundly impressed with the injustice of the whites, determined to await the arrival of the soldiers, which had been friend with their great war chief. Accordingly, when this personage arrived, a great council was held. Black Hawk and his chiefs listened to the speech made by General Gaines, the war chief, warning them that they had been told to leave the country and go west of the Mississippi. Black Hawk replied, We have never sold our country. We have never received any annuities from our American father, and we are determined to hold on to our village. The war chief exclaimed, Who is Black Hawk? Who is Black Hawk? He replied, I am a sack. My forefather was a sack. All the nations call me a sack. The savage noblemen of the forest thought this was enough, but was told that the general neither came to beg nor hire them to leave their village. I will remove you peacefully if I can, forcibly if I must. I will give you two days in which to remove, said the general. The council broke up in confusion. The daughter of an old chief, was sent to the fort to ask that her people could remain long enough to gather their crops in the fields, and another deputation was sent with the same request, but it was denied. Then a steamboat was anchored near them full of soldiers. The Indians crossed the river in the night. To compensate them for their crops, corn was promised them, which, however, was entirely inadequate to their wants. The women and children lamented being deprived of the vegetables, and in the night, a party went across the river to secure vegetables from the fields which they had planted. The whites had no regard for a flag of truce, frequently shooting down the bear. The war which terminated with the Battle of Bad Axe in 1832 was then at an end, after a great reduction of the warriors of Black Hawk's band. The American forces were in command of General Scott. It has been said that Black Hawk's narrative is somewhat apocryphal, but I think it is in the main true. It is a very sad story. Antony Leclerc, to whom it was dictated, was a respectable citizen of Davenport, held in equal esteem by whites and Indians. In his affidavit appended to the narrative, he says, In accordance with Black Hawk's request, I acted as his interpreter. I was particularly cautious to understand the narrative throughout and have no hesitation in pronouncing it true in every particular. Black Hawk's dedication of the work to his captor, General Atkinson, is pathetic and a translation is here given. He was a prisoner at Jefferson Barracks and at the time was 67 years old. He says to General Atkinson, Sir, the changes of fortune have made you my conqueror. The story of my life is intimately connected with a part of the history of your own. I have therefore dedicated it to you. Before I set out on my journey to the land of my fathers, I have determined to give my motives and reasons for my former hostilities to the whites and to vindicate my character for misrepresentation. I am now an obscure member of a nation that formerly honored and respected my opinions. May you never experience the humility that the power of the American government has reduced me to is the wish of him who in his native forest was once as proud and bold as yourself. Black Hawk, 10th Moon, 1833. This story came from the great state of Pennsylvania, being reported in the Philadelphia Times of December 6, 1896. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to continue to uncover all of America's lost and forgotten history, then remember before you leave to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and remember to like and comment below. And we will see you next time on Americana Archives.